Himul. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome in Harlem. Here in Harlem and of course also our online attendance. Uh, my name is uh, Rutte Bruyne and I'll guide you through the program and I will do that with the help of Peter Lamboy, who is moderating the chat, and Kirsten, who comes to you if you want to raise a question. Uh, before we start, uh, there are emergency exits, two there and two there, just in case. Uh, after every um, uh, speaker, you are allowed to raise questions and we'll try to answer them. Uh, we will use the Mentimeter poll. So if you please all browse to www.mentimeter.com with this code. And at the same time, put your phone on silent mode. That would be very helpful. And if everybody is working on that, we have a first question. And that's also, of course, for our online attendance. Do we have the question? Yes, but just for technical difficulties. Oh, technical. Then we just uh, move on with the program. Um, before we start, um, I'd like to tell you something about the building we are in. This building uh, is called the Lichtfabriek, the Light Factory, uh, and it started exactly 120 years ago to deliver gas and electricity to the city of Haarlem. Sixty years later, the factory was decommissioned, and the reason for that uh, is that uh, the Groningen gasfield was discovered, and there was a decision to connect every house, every building in the Netherlands uh, with the gas grid to that field. And now again, sixty years later, uh, the Groningen gasfield uh, stops producing, not because it's empty yet, but it triggers too many air earthquakes. And moreover, we are in a transition to fade out fossil fuels completely. And that brings us here and now. Um, our previous workshop was in October last year. And since then, a lot of things happened which are affecting the offshore wind energy market in the Netherlands. I'm going to do something technical because I have a monitor here, but it makes noise. That's better. Um, in October last year, we had our last workshop in, in Amsterdam. Uh, and in December, there was a coalition agreement for a new government, very ambitious when it comes to the environment, because uh, they said uh, CO2 reductions should be 55% in 2030, and our society should be climate neutral in 2050. And by then we already knew this is going to mean something for offshore wind energy. That means we need more and faster offshore wind energy. In January, uh, for the first time in the D Dutch history, we had a dedicated minister for climate and energy. Rob Jette was sworn into office in, in January. Then something very terrible happens in the next month, in February, when Putin decided to uh, invade Ukraine. It's uh, of course a human tragedy, many lives lost, city destroyed, a very, really terrible situation, but also the geopolitical agenda came in a complete new light. Um, and that puts even more pressure on offshore wind energy to deliver more and faster. Then in March, there were three new wind farm zones designated to accommodate 10 gigawatt extra. And the names of those wind farm zones were selected uh, by a jury. If you were in the Amsterdam workshop, you might remember that uh, we started uh, a competition. Uh, 
we received more than 4,000 applications of submissions and a jury selected uh, three of them, Nederwijk, Doordewind and Lagerlande. That's are the names of the new areas. And just recently there was sent a letter to parliament uh, how the roadmap uh, for the 21 gigawatt uh, looks like. And we're going to talk about that with uh, Joost van Meulen and Karin Heimer. So if you come to here, and I'm going to take off my jacket, this is much too warm. <laughs> Please take a seat. Welcome. Dank. Thank you. Yeah, this letter, yeah, well, you, you call it a letter, I, will, I would call it uh, an essay. It's a 25 page here, it's uh, quite a long letter. Uh, Karin, um, it is divided in, the roadmap is divided in two phases, one of 6 gigawatt, one of 4.7 gigawatt, gigawatt. Why is that? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting us here. Thank you for your question. Um, we've made a decision to divide the roadmap into uh, two sections. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to go one step back to the North Sea program, where the uh, uh, Space 40s farm, uh, wind farm zones mm -hmm. were assigned. 16.7 gigawatt was assigned, of which we can use 10.7 uh, gigawatt for wind farms in, in the period until 2030. The first part of the roadmap consi consists of 6 gigawatt um, and re research has, has shown that um, uh, the, 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 the export cables, uh, uh, the landing of the export cable is quite str straightforward, so that, is, uh, that, that takes no, not too much research anymore, so we can do this 6 gigawatt pretty fast. And, uh, um, uh, for the landing of the other uh, wind farm zones, for example, Nederweek 3 and Doordewind, uh, they are a little bit more complicated, so we need a little more research. Um, and they also cross, for example, the Doordewind landing cables, they cross the precious and protected area of the Wadden Sea, so we need to, to do that uh, 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 thoroughly. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, with, with, uh, uh, after some uh, uh, extra research. Um, and the second part, um, uh, therefore, we, we, we launched the PAWOS program, which will investigate what the best options are to cross the Wadden Sea. So we also have uh, Holland's Coast West South. Uh, no, we don't have the slides yet. Uh, we do. <laughs> There's the roadmap over there. Well, we also have the southern part of the Holland's Coast West uh, wind farm zone. Uh, site uh, 8. It's sev uh, 0 0.7 gigawatt uh, and it's aimed to land in the North Sea Canal uh, area. Um, uh, but whether it can land uh, depends also on the su sustainability ambitions of Tata Steel, which are currently being uh, developed. Uh, as this location is closer to land, uh, to shore, and uh, uh, as much of the prepared preparational research has already been done, it will take probably less time to realize this wind park and the, and the landing cables. So if, the, if we make a decision on the second part in uh, 2024, uh, this, this should provide us with enough time to have the wind park up and running in 2021. Okay, thank you. And uh, another thing I noticed in the, in the roadmap is that, uh, is the assumption that all the wind farms in the additional roadmap are to be connected to the, uh, the tenant grid. Um, now, we read every day in the newspapers that the, the, the grid is almost overloaded in the Netherlands. Um, why is there no hydrogen included in this roadmap? Not yet, I'd <laughs> like to say. <laughs> <laughs> because at least for the first part, we have uh, we've, we, yeah, there are the, the climate ambitions are really big for 2030. Um, we already see that in 2031 uh, we can realize this roadmap, not in 2030. Uh, and we need to act now and we need to act fast. So, uh, by assigning Tenet as the uh, offshore TSO, that was the way to, uh, to, to make speed, to speed up. 
uh, and we have already provided uh, the um, uh, assignment to start with the purchasing procedures for the platforms and the cables. Uh, um, so that is already uh, uh, started and that is the way to speed up. As for hydrogen production, uh, it's still small scale, both onshore and offshore, uh, although it's expected to uh, take flight in the, okay. coming, uh, in the coming years. So it also perfectly fits in the timing of this second uh, part of the roadmap where decision making will take place in 2024. And we, uh, we will include all the research available, new information in that decision ma making also with regard to hydrogen. Okay, uh, talking about the speeding up, um, the 2030 target is now uh, being doubled. Uh, based on what is up and running right now, it's even a tenfold. And we see offshore wind energy market not only in the Netherlands, but all over the world booming. Do you think the supply chain can handle this? And, and what, what, what can the ministry do to prevent an overheated market? That is indeed one of the problems we are facing now, we are all facing now, uh, and we are trying to speed up the process every step of the road. Um, key is to provide a stable and predictable uh, product pipeline uh, that allow parties to benefit from economies of scale. And uh, therefore we investigated what would be best for this roadmap. Um, can I have the next slide, Peter? Yes, there it is, the scheme. Uh, and as you can see, we have tenders of one to two gigawatt in, gigawatt in rounds of approximately four gigawatt. And we hope this would help the industry to, uh, to plan ahead and to optimize the supply chains. Um, the, first, the, the first tender is uh, I'm out of fair, uh, site one to four for four gigawatt. And, um, well, that is the largest amount of wind energy ever permitted in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, it, this has never been done before, so we try to speed up uh, and also focusing on the, on, the, on the tenders ahead of us. How can we uh, shape these tenders in such a way that uh, uh, we can uh, include all the lessons learned so far? We have quite a history already with uh, offshore mm -hmm. winds. Um, and I'm also looking at, at, at you because we need to do this together. We need to, do, to look at international cooperation, but also here, how can we use all the lessons learned to, um, uh, to, to, to make sure that we, we reach these ambitions of 2030. So I'm inviting all of you to uh, help us to share your thoughts with us. Uh, during the summer, we will um, uh, do our homework and see how, how, uh, how uh, the lessons learned can be integrated in the coming tender. Um, so uh, we hope to share some more information on the next RVO workshop. Uh, okay, uh, but we can also ask the, the audience now, is the Mentimeter now uh, ready? Ah, because uh, let us just asked uh, the question to the people who are here, the, the supply chains is sitting here, so. Very nice. <laughs> and at home, of course, of on in the office, uh, watching online, so let's see what comes out. But the good news is that uh, a very small number of people say we have to slow down. Uh, the faster the better and, uh, well, there are some concerns, but we will manage. So that, that sounds good. Just, um, let us then uh, look to uh, some other issues. Uh, Joost, uh, yesterday the headline in the, the Netherlands news uh, were the farmers protesting against a plan of the government to reduce nitrogen uh, uh, depositions uh, because they emit 60% uh, of it. Um, and there, is, there will, some farmers ha have to be bought, uh, bought out. Um, 
and we're not very happy uh, with that, but has the nitrogen also an impact uh, on this roadmap? Yes, it has. But before that, I, I would like to say that I'm, I'm very proud that we have come up with this additional roadmap so yes. soon, so fast, um, uh, as we have a new government as of January, and um, here we are. We already have a doubling of, of the ambition. Um, but having an additional roadmap is no guarantee for success. And I think nitrogen also is one of the issues that we need to, uh, um, well, closely take a look at. Um, what we are uh, doing right now, we are waiting for an important uh, uh, decision by the Council of State for the Portos project, which is a, a storage uh, project for carbon dioxide. And we expect that uh, verdict uh, this summer. Mm -hmm. And depending on the verdict and the, the uh, well, the particular uh, comments that uh, the Council of State makes, um, well, that could mean a whole lot or maybe uh, not so much for us. Um, I think in particular most, ex uh, most um, important is whether the temporary ex exemption that there is for construction of, uh, of a construction projects, whether that will be uh, uphold or whether it will uh, be removed by the Council of State. In the latter case, then we, uh, we do have a problem and that could lead to uh, a delays in the execution of our, our roadmap. Um, at this point, it is too soon to uh, speculate, I would say, but um, we are currently working, as we say, behind the curtains um, for all kinds of uh, possible scenarios and working on plan B or C. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's exciting, but we still have to wait to see, see exactly what the uh, situation will be in, uh, uh, yeah, with, this, uh, with this verdict. No. Let's hope the best out of it. And another limiting factor is ecology. Now, later in the program, we're going to discuss that with the specialist from the Rijkswaterstaat, but um, if what happens if offshore wind energy reach somewhere a, 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 a point where the current levels of acceptable ecological impact is being met? What, what can you do then something to create more room for offshore wind energy? Um, that will depend on what nature of the of the uh, um, uh, the problem is uh, with uh, with the ecological uh, uh, framework. Um, in general, I would say there there is, is also uh, um, a risk of of a delay um, uh, because then we uh, will need time to figure out exactly what kind of solutions there are. But of course, in the meantime, at this point, we are also anticipating on um, different. I would say tracks that we can can walk to uh, um, well to alleviate the, the possible uh, issues that uh, that can arise, and I'd say in general what we see is that the knowledge level of the ecolo ecological situation uh, on the North Sea is uh, still quite limited in a few uh, aspects, mm -hmm. and so uh, one of those tracks will be to increase our knowledge, and I think Ingeborg will tell you uh, a yeah. bit more today about the Rosa program doing that. Um, what we also do at this point already in the wind farm side decisions is to take mitigating uh, measures and um, uh, well, we, we're still investigating what kind of extra mitigating measures would be possible. I think in this respect it would also be very interesting to see what the participants in the Hollandskus West tender come up with because we have one of the tenders that focuses on the ecological... That's, that's uh, the only issue today we're not going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I know, I know, no, but so that's, that's maybe for October then. Um, and apart from mitigating measures, we have also anticipatory, anticipatory <laughs> measures. Uh, it's a very difficult word. Um, where we try to uh, uh, strengthen the, uh, um, well, the ecological situation on our North Sea and maybe also come up with special programs for vulnerable species that uh, are possibly uh, um, affected by, by offshore wind. Um, and I think last but not least, one of the tracks is also to cooperate uh, with, with other countries because we are not alone in this. There's also other countries that uh, signal that um, there are at some points we are reaching the limits of the ecological, fr uh, well, e ecological framework. And um, so we need to also discuss this with these other countries. 
and also see what, you know, what, what solutions they come up with and maybe also if there are solutions that we uh, together, uh, for example, can discuss also with the European Commission. Yes. Um, so different tracks that we are trying to anticipate on this and to avoid that we really run into problems, but still it's no guarantee. Um, so, yeah, okay. still exciting. Well, uh, an, another part of the uh, uh, adjusted roadmap uh, is that also Tenet, of course, uh, needs to speed up. So there's a new development scheme. But there's also an issue warned, a, issue, a, a warning issued by the Dutch regulator that um, if uh, the grid at sea is developed uh, very fast, uh, but the, the growth of the demand, the increase of the demand lags behind, there is a financial risk. Uh, how does the ministry see this? Yeah, I think in general we agree with the regulator, ACM. Um, what we've asked Tenet is to um, already close contracts for the building of, of uh, platforms and, and cables before even the uh, permits for those particular project, projects are, uh, are uh, issued. Mm -hmm. um, so that poses a risk. Uh, also, I think in addition, what we see is that um, all this electricity coming from these extra wind farms um, needs to be consumed near uh, the, the landing uh, location because um, it cannot all be put on, uh, uh, fed into, uh, into the onshore grid. Um, and if this industrial demand is late, for example, um, then you might have a problem with, with congestion uh, because then you need a, a, lar a large part still needs to be fed into the, uh, the onshore, uh, onshore grid. And so the regulator warned for this. Um, I think rightly so. Um, it is also a risk that we acknowledge and that also our minister has uh, elaborated on also in the letter. Um, but on the other hand, um, if we are too late with uh, um, um, well providing uh, uh, offshore wind energy and our industry is, um, uh, is faster than we, uh, than we expect now in um, electrifying the processes, for example, then we might be too late with all the energy that is needed for that. So it is a balance, finding a balance. And yes, we are um, um, well aware of the risks. And um, I think um, we need to take this risk, at least that is the, the position of our minister, um, in order to, to move forward fast enough. So it is a risk that we take, um, um, but we take it with, with yeah, fully con conscious of, of, of doing that. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's now see if there are any questions. Who has a question for Karin or Joost? I can't hardly see you <laughs> because there's a lot of light shining us at us and not at you. I see a question, I think, in, in the back there. So. Thank you. Uh, Bart de Vries, we're also going the DHV. I was wondering if connections to um, East Anglia are being considered in order to deal with uh, conge congestion. Not necessarily East Anglia, but the UK offshore wind farms in general or interconnectors. Yeah, Joost, yeah. a connection to the UK. I think that's a sensitive uh, issue. Uh, it, is, it is something that, that we, and particularly uh, Tenet, so I'll not answer this maybe fully, Timon, so that there will be room for you to, uh, to add, but. Um, it is, it is uh, a possibility that we are already investigating for quite a, quite a time. Um, Brexit, of course, has uh, posed some extra difficulties in, in uh, having these talks with, with uh, British parties. Um, but I think from an energy uh, system point of view, it would be, uh, I think, a logical uh, uh, development. And it is something that, at least that what we've also written down now in this uh, updated version of the, uh, the development uh, um, framework, is that all the HVDC platforms that Tenet uh, will deploy on the North Sea, they are all suitable for, uh, for having an, a hybrid connection to, to uh, for example, Britain or, or any other country. So um, in, in the design of, of, of the offshore grid, it is something that we take into account and such uh, uh, a connection can also be added later on if, uh, if, yeah, if, if negotiations then come to a successful uh, completion. Are there other questions over there?
Yes, Diamond from Blix. Um, and if I look at the planning slide uh, that you showed, I think it's a preliminary planning slide, but um, especially looking at the tender planning itself, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the reasoning behind it, that uh, we're it seems like we have to, have to wait quite a long while to our Maida Vera tender is coming, and then again there's a gap of almost two years. And then in 26, everything is happening at once from a tender uh, perspective. What's the reasoning behind that? Uh? Um, as for the tenders, we are currently uh, preparing the first tender for I Maida Vera and I Maida Vera North. We are looking into the possibilities to, uh, uh, to, to merge these plannings, actually. So therefore, we can see that um, we can we can we can change the planning a bit so we can do this earlier. After that, it becomes a little bit more difficult. It takes a little bit more time. So um, uh, for Nader Week, um, yeah, they are 2026, 20, um, and the other the, the other uh, Nader Week three and Door de Wind, uh, as well as uh, uh, Ten Norte van de Wadden, they take extra time to investigate. So therefore, the tender planning is even even later. But uh, with this tender planning, uh, we tried to, uh, um, uh, to, to do everything as fast as we ca can. So, uh, make the site decisions and uh, uh, tenders uh, as, yeah, as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. If I may add, um, I think, and, and Matej will, uh, will talk about that later this afternoon, um, before we, we uh, open up a tender, uh, there's a lot of investigations that needs to be done, site investigations, met ocean, data, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there's also time needed for that, because we can speed up tenders, but if you don't have any information about the sites, then that will increase the risk. And I think one of our key success factors uh, over the past years has been decreasing the risk for developers. Um, so that's something that we would like to maintain. Um, so it's, yeah, it's finding a balance in speeding up, but also in, in having a very thorough, uh, good quality preparation phase uh, before we open up a tender. There's room for one more, one last question. And that's coming from over, over there. Yeah, I'm sorry, but the other person was faster. Hi. Do you expect to have the same regime for the tenders? So the same model for tendering out the sites as we've seen this year? We are currently investigating what the best uh, option is for tendering. And for every tender, we will, we will come up with the best option using the information available at that time. So there could be different selection criteria for the different four sites coming up. It is possible. We are also looking into option, for example, to include uh, corporate uh, social responsibility, uh, circularity, um, things like that. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next uh, issue. So thank you very much, and you may give them an applause, of course. Thank you. In the meantime, I would like to invite tenants to come up here, and while they're doing so... What's that here? And b before... The, yeah, yeah, Tim and, and Dick, you can uh, come to the stage, but and, and while they are coming, I have a question for you. Does the name Cory rings a bell? Nobody? I hear a storm, and uh, Timon uh, knows all about it. It was the end of January, and we had an information session, an online information session. We were in a lockdown. And we were sitting in a studio in Hilversum, and when we were finished, you had to run away. <laughs> I had to pick up uh, our little son and from, I uh, from daycare. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I took a cup of coffee, switched on my phone again, and I saw breaking news about the Giulietta D, um, the bullet carrier broke its anchor chain, collided with a tanker, and then drifted to Holland's coast south, and then? 
It was a bit ironic. In the, in the session, I was explaining how well we were uh, progressing with the Oloska site uh, grid connection system. And then, indeed, when I was running to the train, when I catch my train to, to go home, I uh, opened my phone and I saw at least a couple uh, uh, notifications <laughs> um, that uh, Corey was, um, was striking, indeed. Um, so, and then, um, well, Dick is even more uh, close to the action than, than I am. Um, it was indeed a, a coincidence uh, that specific day. Uh, but at least uh, our design caters for collisions to a certain extent. Um, but I think, Dick, you can explain better how we proceeded uh, later on. Yeah. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dick Lagel. I work for Tenet. And uh, I agree, it was a very stressful situation. I think uh, many people have uh, followed it in the news. Um, in general, uh, I think uh, if you look at, the, at our technical requirements, we for example, we, uh, we bury our cables generally deeper than permit requires in order to safeguard against uh, dragging anchors. If you look at uh, these jacket constructions that we just saw in the picture, um, they are designed also for impact loads. So uh, when you look at HKZ, we uh, did an investigation after the collision and uh, found out that the damage was very limited. So, um, uh, so from a technical perspective, there, uh, I would say that uh, we take things and, uh, into account and are risk averse. Um, in general, but maybe this is more for the public debate, uh, there is a discussion ongoing to increase the amount of safety standby tugs on the North Sea, together with uh, our Belgium uh, colleagues, that this could be a way forward to, to prevent not only tenant assets, but also your uh, uh, offshore wind farm uh, assets. Um, is that sufficient answer to the I question? Think so. I think so. I think so. And 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 by the way, the, the the platform was damaged, but not severely. No, not severely. And uh, I think we've actually installed the top side exactly as planned. So the time between uh, the collision and the top side installation was used for uh, modeling, checks uh, checks to be done, and uh, and uh, installation is uh, as planned basically. Uh, Timon, um, we already heard something from the Ministry about the new development scheme. Well, they are sitting behind a computer and just write it, and you have to do it. And, uh, but, uh, to be serious, uh, doubling uh, uh, from 10 to 20 gigawatt in the same amount of time, that must be a tough job. How are you going to manage that? Uh, it, it's indeed enormous. Um, well, I think, first of all, we're very happy now that, that we have that clarity. Uh, I think the discussions have been ongoing for quite some time, uh, that we need to step up our gears in the Netherlands to achieve the uh, decarbonisation targets. Uh, so we're very happy to, to be a part of that. And I think not only us, but also the wider market, be it developers, be it suppliers, um, with this clarity, we, we, we can go ahead. Um, and I think, as Karen also mentioned, um, at least the um, first uh, plus six gigawatts uh, of grid connection systems, there's many similarities with the, um, with the amount of air connections that we already had in our portfolio. So, so there we uh, did see opportunities to, to make use of synergies, to make use of our current tendering procedures, um, but also to make use of the current permitting procedures. Um, so that is not to say that there are, there are no risks, to this acceleration, uh, but at least we see chances in our portfolio management um, to create synergies in order to uh, make use of what we're already doing uh, to speed up. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the new, uh, newly added uh, connections, so the two, two gigawatt systems in the north, um, and also the uh, Tonorda van der Wadden Eilanden connection, that was already part of the previous roadmap, but now included in the investigations in the north um, to what, what are the most appropriate ways to, uh, to provide the landfalls for uh, the offshore wind over there. Um, there are certainly challenges, um, but um, again, already to have the plan enables us to really focus on, on getting the job done. Um, and to a similar extent, that applies to, to Native E3. The um, situation is ecologically more complex, um, but nevertheless, we, we are ready to, uh, to, to go ahead. and. Uh, this development framework uh, enables us to do that. There must be a lot of challenges in this whole process. Um, what are the critical ones? I think uh, that was already touched on, on already in the previous uh, session. Uh, one is that we need uh, demand to be developed close to the landfall. Um, 
the onshore grid is reaching its limits as to, to, to what it can accommodate. Um, so in order to, to really make use of, of those connections, because um, there's no use having uh, offshore wind farms and, and having a grid um, if there's no use for the, uh, for the um, renewable electricity, uh, we need demand in, in some sort to be developed um, and also close to, the, the, close to the landfall so that we do not have to spend public money to, to manage the congestions. So I think that is a, that is a major challenge. Um, and I think that is also, maybe if you look at the tendering scheme, um, you know, there, there, there are ways to stimulate this. And I think we need to use the time until the Amar um, Gamma, uh, but also the, uh, the Nader Week um, uh, sites and the, um, and the grid connections to really think, okay, how can we uh, provide the stimulus for the off-takers to, to really make use of that electricity? And in the supply chain, are there ch challenges in the supply chain? Certainly, and if you, uh, Peter, if you move to the next slide. Uh, we already mentioned the uh, increase is, is really enormous. Um, recently, there was a declaration, a political declaration in, in Denmark, um, a town that now all of a sudden everybody can pronounce, which is uh, Ashberg. Um, uh, naming the ambition to move towards 150 gigawatts of offshore wind in four countries uh, by 2050. But already in 2030, we need to have 65 uh, gigawatts installed. And, uh, well, uh, almost two-thirds of those um, uh, gigawatts we will be connecting in the Netherlands and in, in Germany. Um, so that poses enormous risks, also due to the geopolitical situation. Um, Again, they can tell you all about the, the challenges that we're facing in, in various supply chains. Um, but that is then the reason why um, we've also today announced that we will um, move towards a different tendering regime. And next slide, please. Because I think we, um, we also take it as a, um, as a trust in, in, in our conceptual thinking that now this two gigawatt concept that we have been developing for quite some time it's really taken as, as the blueprint for uh, most of the connections that, uh, okay, we need all those extra new gigawatts and we need to have a standardized way of connecting this because, again, that is also one of the lessons learned of the, um, of the, uh, previous, of the previous roadmap, the current roadmap 2023 of the 700 megawatt AC connections, that it's, it's smarter to actually procure one system uh, so that the market can also anticipate on what we're asking. Um, so what we're now doing is um, uh, changing our current tendering um, approach from connection to connection to connection uh, to move towards framework agreements with the major suppliers of the stations and the converters uh, so that they also um, can prepare uh, to uh, produce all these assets that we need um, because um, they you know, if, if they have to wait tender for tender, um, they might not invest in all the production facilities that are required. Um, so that is indeed the way how we intend to, to achieve this, uh, this increased ambition. Because it's, it's not possible to shorten the lead times. Uh, we cannot really shorten realization times. Um, we cannot also not really uh, skip corners in the permitting procedures. So we need to do things smarter. And uh, this is one way how we intend to achieve this. Let's uh, have a look at uh, what's already happening now. <laughs> Coming to you, Dick, because, yeah. uh, well, in Hollandskus Zuid, Hollandskus Noord, Hollandskus West, a lot of activities. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, maybe it's nice to, to take uh, all of you back a little bit to the previous uh, roadmap, the roadmap 2023, which includes uh, Borsele, two times 700 uh, uh, megawatt, being uh, online at the moment. We have uh, another two uh, at HKZ, which, will, uh, which you see a picture over here. Both of them will be delivered uh, this year for sure. And um, uh, of the current roadmap, uh, we are now uh, very near completion of Hollandse Kust uh, Noord, which uh, we have some pictures just to, uh, to get an uh, impression of what, uh, what we are doing. Hollandse Kust Noord will be uh, connected uh, to the offshore wind farm, or the on it will be ready for the connection for the on offshore wind farm by the end of March uh, 23. Um, so what you see here, or what you saw in the previous pictures, are some uh, 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 impressions on the beach works. You have a, a massive uh, trenching machine, 
Um, we just mentioned uh, the, the safety of our assets. Uh, so for example, this cable is being buried approximately eight meters deep into the seabed, which is very, I would say, safe and, uh, and uh, um, well, uh, against future changes of the seabed. Um, yeah, if you go to the next picture, <coughs> Again, uh, the same site, but a few months earlier, where we are installing the, 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 the tubes. And uh, again, some more impressions of, uh, this is not the cable, this is the HDD uh, for which the cable is uh, ready to receive. And uh, last week with, uh, with our minister, Mr. Jette, we, uh, we were proud to announce that the first cable was connected for HKN. And today you have the scoop that uh, uh, the, the third is being prepared and ready, and the second one will be installed uh, starting today. So it's work in progress. Uh, some more pictures of the jetting machine. If we look to the future, um, I think we have Hollandse Kust West Alpha, which is actually part of the, the same roadmap uh, project team, and Hollandse Kust West Beta. West Beta will follow two years later. And then uh, what you saw on the, on the, on the slide, uh, uh, possibly another Hollandse Kust West project and the Noorden van de Wadden. Thank you. Are there any questions for Tenet? There is one over there. Um, while maybe it's nice while we wait for the question, the previous slide shows quite, yeah, one more back. Yeah, here we can see uh, to have an impression of the land station on uh, Wijk aan Zee. We are nearing completion uh, Hollandse Kust Noord. We are nearing completion of Lonsa Kust West Alpha, and we're well advanced to prepare for West Beta. So this is uh, the heart and soul of our system, and it's uh, nearing completion. So that's also nice to share. Wim Klomp, Koyas Koning DV. You've been uh, busy with the uh, roadmap uh, further ahead, eh, with your spoke uh, and hub system uh, on the whole connection of the North Sea. Now you're accelerating the, the Dutch part, and how does that continue with your hub and spoke system. I don't hear anything about uh, ox uh, what is it, uh, energy islands, hydrogen uh, production offshore. Would that be also uh, a need for uh, accelerating that? I think th this also relates to one of the previous questions as to whether we're anticipating uh, international hybrid connections to the UK, for example. Um, if you um, have taken a close look at the slide that we showed with the quadrupling of our uh, ambition, um, we indeed uh, see the need for this future, for this future uh, after 2030. Um, also, these two gigawatt systems, they provide four possibilities to, to make those connections. Um, but uh, indeed, if you look uh, internationally, um, at least we need uh, two parties to tango. Um, we have a regulatory framework that needs to cater for these developments. Um, so indeed, we, we do see the use of this, uh, especially as the capacities increase. Um, then we need to have the possibilities to, um, to transport the electricity to uh, oh, uh, at the moment where the electricity is most needed at, at that time. Um, so indeed, we're um, actively investigating a, a Dutch hub, um, and a hub can, can mean many things, uh, but at least it considers multiple uses for the offshore wind. Um, um, and we then look at what are the electrical capabilities, but indeed with, with other, part other parties, um, also hydrogen and, and, and other aspects are on the table. So Denmark is doing that, yes, indeed, yeah. So if you're looking at international connection, Denmark is well, starting that system and, and looking at uh, an energy island, uh, Belgium is also developing uh, something like that. So aren't we lagging a little bit behind there uh, to the uh, neighboring countries? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, they, they are indeed investigating the, the first concrete uh, showcase. Um, we are cooperating again with those parties in the lines of this political uh, declaration to, to investigate the possibilities. So. Um, we do think this is, uh, this is the future, so we are indeed uh, looking at all the options. Okay, is there another question for Tenet? If not, then I have a question for you, because, Dick, there is an innovation in Holskus Nord. 
because that will be the first platform uh, where customer connections can be made. Yeah. And the, the, the Energy Act is amended for that. Um, and we're going to ask the people here, how do you think those connections can be used? Let's I'm, see. I'm not sure if everybody is aware of, of it, uh, but we have two uh, po possible client connections at HKN platform, uh, delivered by uh, March next year, of uh, uh, 66 kV. Yeah. What do you think uh, will be uh, the most? Yeah, what, I, what I like about this graph uh, is it's more or less uh, equal parts. So uh, apparently we don't know yet. Huh? Uh, we have mixed emotions, so to say, on the concept. Uh, what I personally really like is the uh, option C, electric charging for ships or other uh, uh, equipment to be used in operational manner. So it would be nice, in my opinion, to have electrical vessels serving the wind farms uh, clean uh, 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 with direct uh, charging on site. But that's maybe more of a dream for the future. Um, I can also imagine that, uh, that the oil and gas industry could be interested to receive electrical power uh, to, to avoid uh, costly uh, workovers or changes for future adaptions. And of course, uh, carbon capture uh, could be of interest or maybe even uh, to, to generate uh, uh, other uh, energy uh, uh, carriers. So I do, uh, I do like this uh, graph and uh, happy to, uh, to yeah, hear feedback from others. You select your launching customer there. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, very curious to hear what, what, what other options uh, are on the table. Yeah, so there, no, is there, I don't know if we have the time. Who, who has selected other options and gives us some insight in what you, there's somebody over there. Did, Please, what do you think? Hi, good afternoon all. I am uh, Marijn Pronk of RWE. Um, so I think there's ample space offshore, which can be used for other purposes than just offshore wind. Um, there's a framework being developed for multiple use of the sites. So these customer connections can also be used for other sources of energy production, but also for storage. and. Um, we will have trouble to have everything onshore, so we should use offshore, well, in more ways than just offshore wind. And I think these connections are a good solution or a good start to make sure that we develop these solutions sooner rather than later. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of this block. Thank you very much. And you may also give Tiemann and Dick, of course, the applause. Thank you. Now, if you have been carefully looking around, you miss some people. You miss some people from Vattenfall's HKZ team. And the reason is that they organized an internal event just at this moment. That's the reason why they're not here. If they would have been here, uh, we would have invited them on the stage and they would have presented us a status update. Uh, and that is that uh, at this moment already 80 funda foundations are in place, 70 working platforms are in place, 20 wind turbines are in place, the cable installation works goes on, and on the last slide of this update, you can see that the first power will be <coughs> delivered next month. And then the whole wind farm is commissioned uh, in the second quarter of next year. That brings us to the end of this part of the program. So there's a short break. Uh, we come back here at a, uh, 14.45, a quarter to three. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the work of Rijkswaterstaat on the wind farm site decisions, ecology, the site uh, investigations. And uh, last but not least, with Eva later from the Ministry of economic affairs looking to what's going to happen beyond 2030 
And I'm very curious about that because it was already mentioned uh, 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 by Dick, uh, the first roadmap, the 2023 roadmap, and now we have the 2030 roadmap, and now we have an, an adopted 2030 roadmap. And the funny thing is we have never completed a roadmap. Uh, no, in, in the meantime, it was already <laughs> overcovered with a, with a, with an. Uh, I don't know what this is, but <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> well, so that's <laughs> so. Before we are at the end of a roadmap, there is already a new one, which is uh, even uh, with a higher uh, with, with a higher standard. Let's <coughs> let's have a break now and see you back after the break in forty forty five.
I ask you to take your seats. Welcome back uh, at the stage Ingeborg van Splunder and Bram Dussaar from Rijkswaterstaat. I think that's the only organization in the Netherlands without an English name. It's also a bit strange because you want to say executive agency, but that has now in current times also have uh, got a little bit of a nickname. Okay, but uh, let's go uh, Byline. to the real business. I'm already busy with the wind farm site decisions for MO de Ver 1 till 4. Yes, the, the biggest project at the moment, uh, 4 gigawatts. And uh, we expect the, the site decisions to be uh, published, the concept site decisions to be published at the end of 2002 or uh, beginning of 2003. Uh, uh, 23, 23, 23, 23, 23, sorry. We're not going back in time. Yeah. Um, can you already tell something about uh, the changes of these wind farm site decisions compared to, let's say, the wind farm site decisions of Holland's Coast West? Uh, at, 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 um, at the general level, they will be the same. Um, they will be the same uh, as uh, Holland's Coast West, for example. Uh, the only exemption is um, we will uh, amend the regulations for underwater noise and uh, we are uh, thinking about implementing um, uh, or raising the uh, minimal tip level point um, for uh, reducing the impact on seabirds. So those two are the biggest changes uh, we see currently right now. Uh, uh, why does it help to raise the? Mi I feel this is a difficult thing to explain. But the, the, the minimum tip level. The, 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 w w w w why is that uh, helping? Yeah, um, yeah. Birds have different behavior. You have birds that fly very high. You have birds that fly just over the water uh, surface, and in between that. So we have done some research on what the flight height is of different bird species, and there is. That, that it looks like it that if you increase the tip height, that it might uh, yeah, lower the, the number of collision uh, risk. Okay, okay. And uh, under what, what the noise piling, um, noise emissions are? Yes, that this is a follow-up of the North Sea Agreement. The North Sea Agreement was reached in uh, 2020 by uh, uh, all parties involved also uh, uh, signed. And um, in that preparation of the agreement, uh, there was a, a lot of discussion about the uh, accepted level of impact of harbor poipois. And uh, um, it was agreed that uh, the, uh, now the noise emissions sh should be lowered uh, uh, compared to uh, the ones we have now, uh, for example, in Holland's Coast South. Uh, we also used the experience from Germany and also Belgium, where they also got uh, another kind of uh, uh, regulation for uh, noise mitigation. So combined with that, we are uh, now implementing those, uh, agr uh, those agreements from the agreement, and I refer to Article 5 for you who want to look it up, uh, of the North Sea Agreement uh, in the next side decisions being am out of air. So that means that you think the industry can met these new regulations? Yeah, we, we looked at it carefully before we decided it to. Um, we saw the experience from Germany and Belgium, where the mitigation levels are already lower than in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, secondly, we see a lot of technological innovations, innovations in pile driving and also in innovations in mitigational measures like bubble screens and more that sort of thing. So combined with those three, we think it's a feasible uh, way forward. And also keep in mind that for future wind farms, we still have ecological room to keep on upscaling offshore wind if necessary. Okay. I don't know if anybody here wants to oppose against this. And now that's impossible, then uh, it's now time to stand up. But uh, I don't see anybody doing that. 
Gut, ja. ähm, let's uh, uh, move on. Uh, uh, you uh, mentioned uh, seabirds. Uh, what are measures for other uh, bird species? Yeah, of course, in the ROSA program, uh, we look uh, at a lot of research uh, on uh, birds in general. But currently, we're also preparing a start-stop procedure um, on behalf of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate to uh, 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 decline the number of casualties among migratory birds. Okay. So that start-stop procedure is now in preparation. Can you elaborate a little bit on what, what is a start-stop procedure? Yeah, um, the side decisions uh, uh, will, um, uh, will make it obligatory to uh, stop uh, offshore wind farms when there is uh, a heavy uh, uh, migration of uh, mig uh, migratory birds at rotor level. Um, in that process, it's very uh, important that uh, with regard to grid stability, we know the containment two days in advance to uh, uh, stabilize the grid for uh, shutting down uh, uh, offshore wind farms. So we asked the uh, University of Amsterdam to do more research on the migratory patterns of uh, migratory birds uh, above the North Sea and also to uh, develop a forecasting model to predict um, uh, migration of seabirds at rotor level, so not in general, but at rotor level, uh, two days in advance. And, and do you have already a clue for how long these curtailments uh, will last? Uh, yes, yes, we're still in the process of uh, developing uh, uh, the system, but um, uh, the Minister of uh, Economic Affairs already uh, pointed out in a letter to uh, the Dutch Parliament what our expectations is. We, we are currently uh, talking about migration during the night because that's the biggest uh, uh, migration uh, um, as we know right now. Secondly, we see uh, a difference between spring, the patterns in spring and the patterns in autumn. Um, but given the current scientific knowledge, given the radar data collected in the Dutch wind farms from recent years, we expect a curtailment period of 0.3% of total operation hours per year. Okay, okay. Well, that gives at least an idea what for kind of effect this, uh, this has. Um, Ingeborg, you are one of the people behind the framework for assessing ecological and cumulative effects, the in Dutch known as the KEC. Mm -hmm. And in March, uh, the 4.0 version was, uh, was published, um, together with the North Sea program. Um, what is new in this uh, fourth version of the, of the, the, the framework? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, in the ROSA program, we look at the ecological impact to understand what the impact is of offshore wind on several species that are protected by nature legislation. And we use that knowledge to do that calculation in the CAC uh, 4.0 mm -hmm. to see uh, what the effect on the population size of the species is. So we've done that again now in, uh, for the, the uh, North Sea program. Um, and that means that there is a calculation for different uh, scenarios of search areas. So uh, the, that's one of the things you put into the calculations together with um, the knowledge that has been developed uh, the last years. So it is always stated that um, we do the calculation with the best knowledge at that moment. Uh, and it still goes on the knowledge development because there's an attachment together with the, the CAC 4.0 that al also, <laughs> there's a spider or something, um, that says, um, that points out what the, 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 the parts of um, where it has to be improved, where the most insecurity is, because it's rather difficult to do research at sea. So some things we know rather good and sometimes we know a bit and uh, in the attachment you can already see um, yeah, what the, the proof of imp uh, improvements are, and it gives us 
uh, a signal, an idea of the ecological impact, and our main concern is the birds, uh, the, the marine mammals. It's, it's well, okay with the, the, the underwater noise level. Um, and you see that it, it approaches uh, or exceeds the, the ecological boundaries uh, of certain seabirds now. And <coughs> now, in, in, in uh, uh, the previous uh, sessions with uh, Tenet and, and with the Ministry, of, we, we have been talking about uh, speeding up. Uh, I mean, the target is doubled from yeah. 10 to 20 uh, megawatts. Um, can you still manage to um, have the knowledge development, uh, can you speed that up also? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and what is this, maybe it's better to ask, what is this going to mean for the short term? Yeah, yeah. yeah you mentioned a very big issue, the speed of the, the rollout of offshore wind energy and the speed of uh, research. Um, that's daily on the table. But we try to um, focus as much on the most important species or parameters that are more insecure to give the information, to facilitate the process, to give insight, not especially to make it possible, but just give the facts that we know eh, what, what probably will be the effects. And for a short time, we now continue the work, uh, the results of the CAC, mm -hmm. um, eh, look at the attachment, where is it going, where, where did it talk about, and we making a plan for short-time actions and more long-term actions because you can't do research in two months, but additional analysis we can do. So we just, yeah, look into that right now. Okay, uh, uh, suppose, suppose uh, that at a certain point, uh, ecological criteria are not met anymore. What, what kind of consequences would that have for the roadmap? Um, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, that's more a long-term question, I think. Eh? It will I hope yeah, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know either. Um, so if you, have, if you look at the CAC and you see the results there, um, it gives us now a signal for something that will happen in time. So you have until, yeah, until the next side decision and so on. You have time to do that research for, for my responsibility in my role in this process. I think we have to be very keen on what to do to be on time. But it's not only about knowledge, and, and Joost has already uh, mentioned it also, it's, it's something of, of more uh, players in the field. Uh, and it's very important that uh, industry uh, yeah, has, uh, um, uh, focuses on innovation, technical innovation, mitigating measures uh, yeah, to, to lower the impact. Um, but also strengthening the, the nature, uh, the, the ecosystem. So, um, yeah, that might make the population more resilient for uh, negative influences. And I, I want to stress that uh, if you do that, you have to start with, do I understand what is happening? Yeah, what is the impact? What is the, the relation? Uh, do we understand that? and what is the most vulnerable stage of that species. And then look at the innovation and look at the strengthening of the nature, because yeah, there should not be a mismatch. But so use the ecological knowledge to develop that. Yes, you, you mentioned also innovations in, in the industry. Are, are you in contact with the industry about their innovations? And um, well, yes, we, we do have contact. Well, we try to be here in this, uh, these kind of meetings and other meetings. Uh, we have direct contact with uh, TKE uh, uh, Offshore Wind. Um, we, have, we have a stakeholder meeting with uh, the ecologists from mm, Eneco, Vattenfall, uh, and all the other parties. So, yeah, via that network. So they know what's going to help? Yeah, they, they, they try to, they want to be informed on the ecological effects. Yes. And so, so they can act upon it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Bram, Bram, I come back to you. Uh, we, before the break, uh, we talked about this storm named uh, Cori uh, and uh, the Giulietta D, uh, which has uh, made some troubles in Holandske Zuid, and that, but that also triggered a more general debate on shipping safety. Yes. Um, how uh, is your next start? Uh, uh, mitigating these risks? What, what's going to happen? Uh, 
At the beginning of this year, it was a very, uh, uh, very good learning curve. Also, uh, um, a, a time of interesting uh, uh, thoughts of things we already uh, uh, thought ahead. Um, and next to uh, next to Cori, also another uh, storm um, uh, took place uh, on the 18th of February, and then in Belgium, two ships got into trouble. Uh, one uh, big cargo ship actually sailed through. A uh, heroic uh, thing sailed through uh, uh, the two wind farms on Belgian and uh, uh, the Dutch side. But um, uh, ARES has, uh, 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 has a proactive approach and also a proactive um, uh, way of handling these kinds of, uh, of situations. Since 2020, we are already um, implementing uh, new measures and new approaches to ensure ship safety. For example, the emergency response towing vessels are now, uh, the one is at uh, Borsele positioned and one will be in uh, a couple of days time, uh, per July, 1st of July, will be positioned with uh, Holland Circus South. And we are now talking with the Ministry of Economic Affairs. Um, is it possible to, uh, uh, to implement those rules earlier, for example, during the build? Um, at Borsele, the ERTV was only, um, uh, only started when the park was operational, for example. And also other measures like censoring uh, sight on sea, and with the Coast Guard we are uh, looking into uh, uh, implementing a lot of measures since uh, 2020. But if you want to hear the latest about that, uh, we at Rijkswaterstaat uh, organize a, a seminar on uh, September the 21st of this year. It will be held in uh, Scheveningen, the pier. It will be in Dutch, so uh, uh, please ask your Dutch colleagues to participate if you want to hear the latest about monitoring and uh, research on uh, ship safety. And uh, the uh, registering address is uh, shown above me, I see. Yes. So okay. please be invited. Okay, thank you. We're going to see if there are any questions about the wind farm site decision, safety and ecological impact. Who has the first question? Here in the front. And one question to Ingeborg, the tip clearance measurements. Uh, you, measured, you mentioned that it will be uh, upscaled to t from 25 meters to, can you be more specific about the actual uh, height? And the second question is, you mentioned also about the impact of, uh, on ecology. Uh, can we design a wind farm by design such that it strengthens the e ecology up front? And how can we help to reach that? To avoid that we have to do an impact assessment that is negative, we have to mitigate, but we can do it up front. Yeah. Um, I didn't hear, it was a bit muffled, so you yeah. said. The, the first question yeah, I can I answer. I think you know more about the tip height. Yeah. Yes, the minimum uh, level uh, for the tip, uh, the lowest tip, tip point, I always say blade clearance above main sea level, perhaps that's better, but in the side decisions we uh, mention it as uh, minimal, low, minimal lowest tip level. Uh, but basically, uh, is currently now 25 meters. Uh, we are looking into several approaches and into uh, several scenarios to raise that tip level to accommodate less uh, collisions with uh, seabirds. But we are still doing our homework, um, so to say. So therefore, um, uh, after that phase, we can uh, include uh, industry also in uh, what we expect or what your uh, possibilities are. and. So come together to a, a, a tip level, which on the one hand uh, sustains ecology, and on the other hand also minimizes the loss of energy, develop, uh, energy production uh, for the industry. Okay, the next. And, and now the, the other question I think was about how can we design an ecological friendly park? Yes. Well, actually, that is. Um, we want to ask you, <laughs> <laughs> and I think the, the things we work with right now, I think that's well known that you have collision of birds, you have underwater noise and marine mammals, uh, and um, uh, impacting the habitat uh, that the birds and the uh, marine mammals where they feed on. Um, we have the start-stop uh, for the migratory birds. Um, so yeah, there's a relation between the blade size and the collision rate, so that's the things we work with right now, and we're very curious uh, what ideas uh, are out there to improve that. Yeah. 
and so far it all also helped that the wind turbines became bigger. Yes, yes. And he, yeah, does, so he doesn't like bigger, it anymore. Yeah, the bigger <laughs> there are, less <laughs> turbines you have yeah. to put in an area. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, well, but we, we, we hear now in the industry uh, uh, a debate coming up to slow down that process because yes, it costs yes. an awful lot of money. Yes. Yes, but we're coming in a, in a situation where uh, sometimes uh, uh, simple solutions aren't available anymore because we are upscaling and upscaling. So the impact on ecology is also upscaling. So we have to find a new balance. Yes. Okay, next question here or at the chat. I don't know if there's anything in the chat. But oh, here's yes. a <laughs> question. From speaker to speaker. I, I don't know <laughs> if I'm completely out of bounds now as, as one of the... Uh, but uh, um, I wanted to add something about um, and, and um, the possibilities for offshore wind farm developers, how to deal with, uh, with ecology. What I think um, would be interesting is to hear what kind of solutions um, the industry sees for um, um, the process of destratification. Uh, of ocean, the ocean water column. Uh, what we see now in certain parts of uh, the Dutch North Sea, there is uh, a, a large stratification where you have different water layers, especially during winter time. And um, what happens when you put all the monopiles in the water that they, uh, they create uh, uh, whirls with mix which mixes uh, the, the water column and, and uh, results in a destratification of that. At this point, we are not really sure um, um, what the ec ecological impact exactly is, but I think that could be one of the new um, elements, so to say, where we would be very interesting of the ideas of the industry, uh, how to, uh, to avoid this mixing process, what kind of technical solutions, for example, would be possible to, uh, to, uh, to limit that. So, I think that would be something new, um, so that's why I would like to, uh, to add that. Thanks. Okay. Anybody who wants to respond or a next question? Um, Do you see any, anything from the chat? Yes? Uh, yes, there's, also, there's quite a lot of interest in the, in the minimum low, um, uh, lowest tip level. So already a question was asked about it in, in, in the group, um, but are aspects and business case aspects of wind farms also considered in the process of determining uh, the minimum lowest tip level? Or is it all ecology? It's, uh, we do this uh, due to ecology, but that doesn't mean we uh, do not pursue uh, an integral approach because we also need uh, energy production. So um, we look at both sides. It's a simple question as that. Uh, we also, uh, in the future, will look at uh, what it means for the LCOEs and uh, business case aspects. So this is also a part where we can uh, uh, have talks with the industry. And already the Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs started that uh, a couple, uh, I think, last week or the week before that. Um, so just as um, uh, Joost mentioned, we are doing our homework. We hope that the industry will do their homework and then come together for an approach from different angles. Yes, if, are there any more questions? Yes, over there. Thijs van Aastere, Aratus, uh, question. Um, we can only uh, use the area once, so it's good that also ecology is looked at, but also food production, is that also taken into account? Uh, Co-use uh, co co of uh, wind farm uh, areas is uh, taken into account. The national program, which was uh, published uh, in, uh, in March of this year, stipulates also a new policy for uh, 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 multi-use of uh, wind farms, uh, not only for nature strengthening, but also for food production, seaweed, uh, passive fishing, and uh, other forms of uh, multi-use. So that's taken into account. The side decision directs itself to the wind farm, but on the, uh, like, like in a mirror, 
the, uh, um, uh, the area passport directs itself to the initiatives and actors and shareholders and uh, stakeholders who are uh, planning to do a multi-use activity within the wind farm. So I can, so I could refer you best to the national uh, the national policy we've just uh, published. I hope that is a good answer for this gentleman. Are there any more questions? No. Then I'm going to thank you for presenting this, and you get an applause from the audience, of course. Thank you. So, still pretty warm here. Uh, let's move on. Mate, may I invite you uh, at the stage? And, uh, well, let's get rid of one of those chairs. That's just standing in the way. So, well, for RVO, same question as for uh, Tenet and Rijkswaterstaat. Also, you have to double the speed. Yes, uh, we're still looking for people, so uh, that's <laughs> for sure. Uh, Yes, um, what we are now facing is immense, of course. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, to do this, but also that has some challenges. Um, let's uh, let's be real. Uh, we have to do a lot of work in advance of the uh, site decisions, and that means that we also have to compress the schedule of doing the site investigations. Uh, at this or until now, we did it well in, in sequence, mm -hmm. and now we're doing more in parallel. So we're doing more. Uh, geophysical uh, surveys uh, at the same time, or at least we are uh, already procuring them. So yeah, that, that was noticed by the press. Yes. They see so many announcements yeah. uh, of European tenders. Yes, uh, uh, what we did, especially, uh, I think we started last year, uh, Q4, and uh, also the beginning of this year, we um, did a lot of procurements, or we uh, published them on TenderNet, and uh, that raised, of course, a lot of questions, but also still a lot of offers, so there's still interest of the market in this. Uh, but you will see that um, in the end, they have to do it. So, and we are now seeing already that uh, order books are quite full, uh, 2023, yeah. 2024. So uh, we also try to uh, pull it a little bit forward uh, to see, okay, if we can make a contract already this year, uh, maybe for not yet next year, but the year after. But okay. yeah, it also has a backside of it that you cannot put in uh, much uh, innovations in that. Yeah, yeah. That's so uh, that's it, it would be easy to do a procurement for several uh, surveys at the same time, but then there's no room for innovations. Yeah, and we'll come, we will come back to that. Um, the work on the Holland Coast West is finished. Yes, How's progress in the other wind farm sites. Uh, we also finished actually uh, uh, to van der Wadden, but yes, that's of course delayed. In yeah, the that, that's uh, quite early. That's, that's <laughs> very early, <laughs> but uh, we didn't know at that yeah. time, of course. So uh, we finished that as well. There's only a few uh, uh, items left that will be published. And we also did uh, the beginning of this year, of course, the webinars for all the uh, investigations. So uh, the, the information is there. So as soon as the tender can be published, then uh, we are ready for that. Yeah, I'm afraid uh, looking at the schedule, the ministry published, uh, you need to fresh up uh, the people by the time that's the true. tender opens, but we'll yeah. see. Uh, next one is uh, Amuitver, so that's what we are uh, very much busy with. And to be a bit more specific, that's uh, the same Amuitver uh, size 1 to 4, the, the first yes. 4 gigawatt. The, the first 4 gi uh, gigawatts, yes. Um, we are at this point uh, producing some more geotechnical data, the in situ uh, data. It's coming in, uh, I think, the next quarter. Uh, the interim lab results are coming uh, quarter four, and the uh, integrated ground model is coming the first quarter of 2023. And that's the interim results. So we decided to publish also interim results in order to uh, prepare the market for uh, doing their work uh, instead of publishing it afterwards uh, when everything is ready. So that's why we uh, try now to speed up the process. Otherwise, you won't met the schedule? Well, uh, we are m uh, meeting the schedule, but the tender phase is not yeah. uh, uh, met. Okay. Um, 
and if the uh, tender is indeed in quarter four of uh, 2023, uh, we also always say that it's about nine months to one year in advance. We're not going to make that, but uh, at least you have the results uh, for preparing yeah. for the tender, and then the final results will come in uh, quarter two. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's quite remarkable. There is a Met Ocean campaign going on. Yes. With two, actually. Two, but with, uh, with how many boys? Uh, there is one campaign now running in uh, MI de Ver still, uh, that started at uh, the beginning of this year, and that will last for uh, 24 months, of course, and there's also already, uh, the buoys are deployed in Nederweek, and that's what we decided, okay, let's pull it a little bit forward, and already deploy the buoys, uh, already for Nederweek, although the tender is only in 2025. But then we already have the data, Very good. but for MI de Ver, um, Probably there will be uh, only uh, a, uh, a limited amount of data available from this uh, Met Ocean campaign, uh, but that's the case. Since uh, the first set of data in Borsela, uh, mm -hmm. people here uh, are familiar with the fact that every data set has new improvements, higher quality. What can we expect? Um, well, for Met Ocean, um, not so much, that was we also uh, put on an other pre procurement for the next uh, uh, wind farm zones. Uh, but as I said, for geophysical, geotechnical, we always want to make that improvement. Uh, for the geotech and the ground model, we are moving forward to uh, more synthetic uh, improvements. Uh, synthetic CPTs, uh, uh, synthetic predictions in the ground model, uh, more and more. And also the 3D modeling will help. Mm. And that's for sure helping. Um, for Aymuy de Ver, we decided not to do that, or it was not ready yet. Uh, for uh, That's for site f uh, one to four, but for five and six, it does. And also for Nederweek, we decided to do the complete area of Nederweek Zuid in 3D. So, and that means that we'll save time in the uh, uh, ground modeling and also in the geotechnical campaign. Okay. So we are, again, pulling forward uh, all kinds of results. Okay. And that's the, um, the, the, the biggest innovation. Okay. Uh, anything else you would like um, to mention? Well, maybe, yes, as I said, we're already starting with the areas uh, uh, in the north of the Netherlands uh, with the Met Ocean campaign, because we think we might uh, end up in a discussion also with industry about, uh, yeah, what's the best strategy for, uh, for doing this, uh, this um, uh, measurements. So we are looking into maybe far awake effects. So uh, to uh, have two sets of data uh, coming from a distance and also in the western part of the Netherlands, that's why we deployed so many buoys there, is uh, uh, determining the gradient in the, in okay. the wind speed uh, to a better level. So that's also an innovation uh, we try to do. And yeah, uh, and maybe we already will start with Lagerlander, but that's for beyond 2030. Okay. How do you mean beyond 2030? Well, the tender will okay. be uh, beyond 2030, okay. but okay. not for us because uh, we, yeah, we are uh, moving on. Okay. Let's see if there are any questions here or from the online participants. Is there anybody here who wants to raise a question? They're all in blue, but there is a question there. Hi. Um, yeah, I had a question about the, the tender procedure for the ground modeling. Um, we see that the criteria which are put in the uh, tender uh, re uh, request are quite specific and quite strict. Um, in our view, that might unnecessarily restrict the amount of parties, which might be helpful in uh, speeding up the process and also uh, limit the amount of innovations which are available in the market. So we were wondering uh, what your thoughts are are about that? It's a very good question. Um, actually, what we did indeed is uh, 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 have it a little bit strict in order to have the, the, the quickest of the results. But indeed, for the next uh, uh, procurements and tendering phases, there will be uh, room for more innovation. So we're looking into that. And also, we are um, well having the discussion with the market what kind of innovation that would be. Of course, it's always a balance between, okay, can you be, well, 
do you give a blanco check, or uh, do you be, uh, or are you being strict uh, on the results? So, but yes, the tendency is uh, towards more uh, uh, innovations and openness. The next question. If not, do you have any closing remarks? Let's move forward. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. And Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you may give Mate also an applause. Uh, and then I would like to invite Eva Leder on the on the stage. Thank you. Because Eva, welcome. Thanks. No, I already mentioned it before the break. It's kind of tradition that uh, you publish a roadmap and before we are even halfway, there is a new one even more challenging. And, and, and so we, are, we heard about uh, the 20, 2023 roadmap, the 2030 roadmap, the adjusted 2030 roadmap, and that just published, and you are already very busy with, with the next one. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry for that. Um, <laughs> no, they, they, they think it's okay, but no, I, I saw the slides before that most most people think we have the right pace, so that's that's good. Um, no, I think uh, you are completely right, and um, I I don't want to pretend like um, the current roadmap and the additional roadmap are uh, already uh, set in stone and everything is uh, ready already, but it is work in progress. So every. As long as everything goes according to plan, we will, uh, we will manage. Um, but we have seen uh, lately that there have been new developments and we cannot afford to uh, wait at the yeah. moment uh, before we uh, will publish, no, not, not necessarily in the next roadmap, that will take a few years, I promise, uh, but at least some vision for the, for the future. Can you show the slides, uh, Peter? Ah, thanks because I think this, uh, this slide indicates why, uh, why we're doing this here. Um, we have this meeting in Esbjerg, it was mentioned already. Um, the, the previous, sorry, yeah. Uh, we have this, um, yeah. yeah, this one is good, thanks. Um, so we, uh, in Esbjerg there was this really big meeting, I think everyone heard about it, and we showed a, co a combined ambition um, for the four countries only of uh, 150 gigawatts in 2050. Um, and, but that's not it. Uh, of course, we need to develop with the other North Seas countries uh, our new plans for 2040 and 2050 already this autumn. Yeah. So that's, that are indicative plans, but still uh, the Commission asked us to develop those plans. Uh, and also that uh, makes that we have, uh, as the Netherlands, we have to set down our, our ambitions as well. And that is also something that the coalition wanted. Uh, the coalition agreement, like you mentioned, has not only uh, made some targets for 2030 and 2050, but also for 35 and 30, uh, 2050, 2040. So many different years and many different ambitions, but they're all high. And um, they also said that the main driver for the energy transition should be solar PV on rooftops and offshore wind. And we both know what the general output yeah. is, and we will definitely be the winner of that. And so. It's a lot of work. How, how was the atmosphere in Esbjerg? Because you were there. I was there, yes, it was really nice. And, and also from a political point of view, there was a kind of political transition, at least with the man on the right. Yeah. In, in his, <laughs> when he, he, his, his first uh, government he ran as uh, prime minister, uh, he was still, in, in during the elections, he was saying wind turbines run on subsidies. Yeah, and he now, kind he, of came now back he signed from that. an 150 <laughs> gigawatt deal. So. No, so. actually, he came back from that, so that's good. I mean, uh, it's better than than maintaining in your former position. Yes. And also, we that's I think that's also because of our approach. Of course, yeah. back when he said that, not to defend him, but when he's uh, when the prime minister uh, made those remarks, uh, it was a completely different time. And uh, after that, we've proved together with the sector that we can actually manage large. Um, large offshore wind farms uh, that actually are uh, subsidy free. Yeah. And that's something that we want to continue with also after 2030. Well, that's uh, very good. Um, you Ooh. have said something about what's going to happen. Are you foreseeing any policy letters to make it a little bit more concrete? Yeah, of course the government likes policy letters. So uh, can you put that on the screen? 
perfect, thanks. So we just published a roadmap, like you said, but we are also looking ahead. So we are the, um, publishing several um, documents. Um, two important letters that will be published after the uh, summer will be um, one letter on the tender um, that we um, anticipate for MI de Fair. As we mentioned already, we cannot go into details about that, but uh, the idea is to, to at least uh, send out the letter this, uh, this autumn. And also we will send out a letter on the vision for the longer term uh, with the general trends that we see for, uh, for the offshore wind policy. Those are the two general uh, policy documents. And in addition, we will uh, publish two things that I think the market would be very interesting in as well. One thing is that you have been asking us a lot about, and that is uh, a procedure and requirements for permits, uh, lifetime extensions. So we will be working on that um, this uh, fall, and we will uh, consult the market on that as well. And the other thing is that we have just updated the compensation scheme for when the offshore grid is not available, which will come into, um, into force on the 1st of January next year. Okay. But we have to update it again. Yes. <laughs> Every time we have to update something when we publish something. No, because we have to update it for the HVDC cables. They have a different um, structure, so we, we need to look at that as well. Yes. And of course, we will, uh, well, we're closely working with that with tenants, but we will also talk with the market about it. Okay. Yep. Um, well, everybody here on stage uh, has talked about challenges. There are a lot of challenges. There are always a lot of challenges. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the really important challenges we have to met? Yeah, there are of course many challenges and I think a lot of them have been mentioned already yeah. today. Uh, but I think our general central challenge is to increase pace and size and to maintain uh, the, the, the successful elements that we have but make them also more future-proof. And to be a bit more specific that I think we need, uh, we have four general challenges that we see. Uh, some are more for the market to tackle, other ones are more for the, for the government um, to tackle, but we need to do it together, of course. I think an important one is a technological one. Uh, of course, we have seen incredible uh, developments in the output that the turbines uh, can produce. That's really has been beyond expectation. And I think now we have to uh, move on to an, also an additional, uh, more systemic approach. So that means that we have to include ecological criteria, like uh, Ingeborg already mentioned, uh, that we have the biodiversity crisis, but there's also uh, a problem with the materials that need to be sustainable. Um, there is the issue of uh, system integration, so how do we make sure that the energy that we produce will actually um, be there in the right form, in the right time, in the right way to be used uh, to actually green, uh, green the Netherlands, so to say. And um, yeah, we need more flexibility in that sense. So we, uh, we need to include that in our tender design, but maybe also in the, in the farms themselves. So I think that's the general technological development and the technological challenge that we see. And then we have the uh, environmental issue that was already mentioned before. And I think that we need both technological solutions there, but also more knowledge um, and also more cooperation with other countries because they recognize this issue as well. Um, system integration is a general trend that we see and that is uh, something we, we need, which means that we need uh, more um, hubs as well to, to create uh, the infrastructure internationally um, and to make uh, it less a radiant um, connections between wind farms and shore, also to make it more resilient. Um, so that's, that's an important trend, I think. Um, and lastly, uh, the maritime spatial planning. I think it was mentioned already before as well. Uh, it has several elements. Uh, so first we need to assign additional uh, areas. We have already a lot of search areas and also a lot mm -hmm. of uh, designated uh, wind energy areas. But not of all of them are really suitable for, uh, for the realization of large offshore wind farms. So we need to look into new areas as well. But also we have to be a bit more creative maybe. Uh, we had the luxury before that we can just develop our, our uh, wind farm in an area. Uh, but now there is m much more pressure on, uh, on multi-use. I think it was a question already yes. from the audience. And um, so we have a few cases that we are working on. Uh, one of them is uh, the case of Lagerlander. 
So it's uh, the search area two. And we have, um, there's already a lot of uh, gas platforms there, ambitions for CCS, and we are looking into the option of adding offshore wind there as well. And the other idea is to look into the area four, which is an active um, marine exercise area, and that's kind of uh, exciting because they are actually practicing there with planes and boats and shooting munition. And whether that would be a good idea to, to combine that with offshore winds, that's, uh, that's a question. And I'm actually also curious how the, the public uh, looks at that. No, we, we, we can <laughs> ask them, uh, because for, for, yeah. for the combination offshore wind CCS, uh, that seems feasible. Mm -hmm. We have seen first reports of that. But for uh, the combination of military practicing <laughs> and a wind farm, uh, yeah, well, I, I did s see something in the uh, uh, last uh, NATO exercise in uh, Friesland where a French uh, pilot thought, exercise. well, <laughs> let's cross through the Gemini wind farm. Um, but we have a, a question yeah. about that combination. And so if you want to grab your phones again for the last time, I think. D do, do you think that is a, a possible combination? And so, and, and, and don't answer it in a way, what would you like? Because, you know, we have to deal with this situation. So it's really, what do you, do you think it's possible? <laughs> Be because I know what you you're really, uh, prefer. Uh, That's you're really uh, sending out the answer already, <laughs> yes. Uh, Ruth. <laughs> yes. Oh. And, and, and that helps, you know? You can see. Yeah, and it is, oh, of course, a really black and white uh, question. And uh, of course, this is not how we would implement it, but uh, it, it's good to get a bit of a teaser from uh, and a good starter for the, the drinks later. Yes. Yeah. But it, it's uh, actually, I, 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 I'm quite uh, happy with uh, an answer like this, because this, this, these are challenges we have to deal with, and it, it seems that the industry is willing to, to do that, so that's mm -hmm. good. Uh, and we have another question for, yeah. and that is... It the last question is that we, that's related to the ecological challenges that we uh, already mentioned and touched upon. And uh, we're curious how you see this. Is currently, it's really a, a legal uh, showstopper, but do you think there are actual technological challenges that, we'll, uh, that we can make it work? Oh, that's convincing. That's <laughs> Well, that is... Uh, it is quite a hopeful story, though. Very hopeful. Well, actually, we are, uh, at the moment, we're also um, trying to see, because we cannot take all the information that was put into the, the tenders of Hollands Coast West, no. um, because we have these Chinese walls between our organizations yes. very well. Um, but I'm curious... Even I can't cross that wall no, no, during the assessment. No, yes. That's too bad. No, but the, be, because of that, we cannot really get all the yeah. information that was, uh, was, was sent into the proposals. And we were actually really curious what was sent in. So um, we are interested to start a dialogue uh, well, with you to, uh, to see whether uh, we can learn from, from what, you, what the, the parties that actually participated in the tender uh, had as ideas um, to, to challenge the ecological um, challenges also for the, um, the next uh, tenders. Yes. And, and I think uh, people who think, who did not submit a, a, a proposal, but do have a, a brilliant idea are also welcome. Very welcome, yes. So that's uh, an invitation for you, just to help us to solve this problem. Yeah. I can imagine that there are some questions. Uh, who has the first question for Eva? Here in Haarlem or online, there's a question over there, I think. Over here in the middle. Was there a question? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was somebody else, but... Uh, it was someone else, it wasn't <laughs> me. Um, I was curious, uh, um, do you also take into account the, the, the first wind farms that run out of their permits in your plans beyond 2030? Well, uh, for this plan, we are only looking in the, the ones that are... Um, that have their basis in the, the Offshore Wind Act. So that's only the third phase after uh, starting with Porcelain. Uh, the others are, um, have a different legal scheme, so they have a li different situation and they have to, um, for prolonging their per uh, permits, they have to go to the uh, Waterwet. 
Yeah. Okay. And then the gentleman there, yes. Behind. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jacoba from Den Helder. Um, I was wondering whether in the next letter there will be uh, some additional information about landfalls, tenants, or is the current statement in the letter we just received uh, what is also applicable for the next phase? Uh, sorry, uh, information on what? On the landfalls. The tenant connections of the of the, 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 the landing. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so there, there was some publications already in the in the previous tender, and there was also in the letter of I think last December there was the, this plan for the Vavos, uh, the exploration of the uh, of, um, of the grid connection. Um, in the letter that we will send uh, this uh, autumn, we do anticipate to have some, some general notion on that, but there's also a separate project on this, which is called FABOS 2031-2040. Uh, and uh, that's uh, a process going on at this moment and it will be published. I think there was, there's a stakeholder event at the end of this month or uh, at least soon. Um, and there's a, they will present the results of their first, um, their first phase. Okay, the next question. I don't see any hands anyway or here in the front. The Hi, I'm Jot Stam from Teno. Uh, I have a question regarding your uh, areas beyond 2040. It almost covers the complete Dutch continental shelf. Is there going to be a national research agenda that supports this development after 2040? Or are you going to stay with those pockets? Or are you going to produce a systematic research approach for this whole area? You mean international or within the, the Dutch territorial waters? Both. Yeah. So uh, what we are doing is, um, is looking at basically uh, starting to look at the entire sea again and what are most um, promising areas. And we also are cooperating with other uh, countries around the North Seas or neighboring countries because we have to develop our, our plan together, especially if we want to develop hubs that are connected with uh, wind farms and hubs in other countries, then it's really important to have this uh, map mapping out together um, as countries. But to, to, um, we, we, do, we don't have a clear picture yet on what the entire, entire ambition should be for 2050 or for 2040. So we are developing that first in, as part of a national plan for the energy system. Um, and then we will take that and see what that would mean for the, for the offshore. Next question. Hi, um, thanks for this. Um, my name is Guido, I'm from Shell. And I was wondering if uh, um, there's a huge hydrogen demand coming up, uh, also after 2030. Can you elaborate a little bit on the connection you see between the route map for hyd hydrogen and route map for, for wind after 2030? And if you foresee that there will be any uh, wind farms or wind, wind plots dedicated for hydrogen in the far future? A uh, very good question. I actually forgot to touch upon uh, uh, offshore hydrogen, which is uh, really a big topic. Uh, and we always say we are the, the offshore wind energy team, not, uh, not limited to electricity, but we are just general energy. Um, so that means uh, we are looking into uh, to offshore hydrogen. At the moment, um, we have these ideas of, of well, basically putting, getting the electricity to shore and then um, um, changing it into uh, hydrogen, but we hope that in the near future we, it will be possible to develop um, offshore hydrogen as well. Uh, we are working on, um, on a policy towards, well, the idea is that we start with a demonstration project uh, on a smaller scale of uh, 100 to a few hundred uh, megawatts, and then uh, after 2030 a bigger rollout. And then at that point, I think there will be dedicated uh, tenders as well, also because we basically have almost enough electricity by then uh, if all our plans are, uh, are realized by then. Okay. Another question? 
no more questions, then uh, I'm going to thank you, Eva. Thank you. And you may also receive an applause, of course. <laughs>So that brings us to the end of the program, the formal program. Um, I can already announce the next workshop that's on the 29th of October. November. November. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's, it's right on the screen, wrong on my notes. November uh, in Amsterdam during OEEC 22. As usual, the slides, uh, Q&As, etc., uh, URLs of the websites can, can be found. Uh, on our websites. Um, I would like to thank you here in Haarlem and also the people who have been participating online. Thank you very much for that. And uh, the last thing I would like to say, I'm going to say that on behalf of, of you, if you agree, and I would like to again uh, thank the speakers on behalf of the audience, uh, and not only the speakers, but also the teams behind the speakers who have made this all possible. Because, you know, when such a 25-page letter uh, comes out, there is an enormous amount of work uh, behind it. And the same for Rijkswaterstaat, uh, Tenet and, and RVO. So, if you agree, you may applause for that. And thank you for coming. See you in Amsterdam, and it's time now for some drinks and bites, but it's only for the people here in Haarlem. That's